Hello everyone, our next speaker is John Sutherland and he's going to take us on a tour of iteration on Python. Please give him a big hand. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming. I realize it's late on a Friday of a long week. Um, so thanks for coming. Um, so this is iteration, iteration, iteration. Uh, this is my name. Uh, pretty good for a slide, I think. Uh, this is my internet name, um, where you can find me on Twitter, GitHub, Telegram. Uh, and I'll be tweeting links to the slides afterwards. Um, I work at a place called FanDuel in Edinburgh, Scotland, where we make a, an online daily fantasy sports thing, but I'm not going to be talking about that. Uh, as I already mentioned, this is iteration, iteration, iteration. Uh, so most of programming is uh, loops, conditionals, and a few other bits and pieces, and everything okay. else is a kind of nice to have on top of those, those two things. Um, so what we're going to cover this afternoon is, uh, or what we're going to look at this afternoon is uh, some basic loops, uh, recursion, uh, look at reduce, so, um, iterators, iter tools, uh, list comprehensions, generator expressions, generators, coroutines, and then at the very end, some stuff that you really shouldn't do. Can we unplug it and plug it again? Or? <laughs> okay. Um, so we're going to use a contrived example uh, of factorial um, for the first few examples, uh, just to demonstrate some of the basics. Um, it's quite boring, um, but reasonably well understood, and hopefully you can, uh, you'll be able to see the differences between the different methods. Uh, so for anyone who's unsure or can't remember from their high school maths classes, uh, four factorial, uh, so four uh, bang here is four times three times two times one. Uh, so the while loop, so Python has while loops, which you don't see that often. Um, unless you want to create infinite loops, uh, which I do all the time for fun. Um, and here's factorial with a while loop. So uh, we can see here uh, the iteration state, which is the, the variable n, uh, the calculation and the actual looping itself are all kind of bundled together in these three lines. There's quite a lot going on here. And you would never really write this, I don't think. Uh, not like this anyway. Um, this is Python and we can do better. We have the for loop. Um, so the for, for loop version no. of uh, factorial uh, is something like this. So we would iterate through a range uh, from n to 1. So in this case, we're actually going backwards uh, with the minus huh? 1 on the end there. And every time, we're going to multiply our, our running, uh, our accumulator fact uh, by i, and then return that at the end. And this is nice. Uh, this is probably the best way to do this uh, for this no, case. Um, but the problem uh, is no, uh, our factorial logic has been moved and our iteration uh, variable are all uh, hooked up together. Um, so we could do it with a recursion. So some of you may have noticed um, that four factorial is actually four times three factorial. Um, so the definition of factorial is recursive. Um, uh, sorry. And in the general case, n factorial is n times n minus one factorial. And we can see that quite nicely in this code. So here factorial, the definition of factorial uh, includes a call to factorial, which is, is recursion. Uh, so the if here is our escape clause, and this pre prevents us from looping or uh, recurring forever. For larger, va uh, for larger values of n as well, we could uh, blow up the stack, uh, and we'll get a, r a runtime error. So we should probably use the for loop version rather than this recursion. Uh, and the last of our factorial examples is with reduce. Um, so what we're going to do with reduce is uh, we're going to create the number is 1 to 4, and then we're going to use the reduce uh, function uh, and the multiply, multiply operator to collapse our list of 1 to 4 or 1 to n into a single value. Um, so uh, since Python 3, uh, reduce moved into funk tools, um, but previously it was a built-in. Um, so yeah, th and this works. And this is reasonably clever, but uh, where I work, and certainly if, if I was code reviewing, I would you'd be getting a thumbs down on that one, or a nice, a nice suggestion, would you mind changing this to a for loop? Uh, so slightly more interesting than factorial uh, are iterators. And iterators are, are created by calling iter on an iterable. And a lot of this was quite confusing and quite complicated, but hopefully we'll be able to follow it through. 
Um, so iterables uh, implement one of two protocols, the iteration protocol, uh, which is uh, the dunder iter method, or the sequence protocol, which is uh, dunder get item, uh, and we're passing in integers starting at zero. And then iterators, not iterables, iterators implement the iterator protocol, which is uh, dunder next. So here we create the iterator uh, of a, uh, a list 235 uh, into our iterator, and then we just, uh, successive calls to next yield the values 235. And if we call next on uh, an exhausted iterator, then we get a stop iteration at the end. Uh, in practice, though, you would never actually need to catch that stop iteration because uh, you would use this in a for loop. So this is, this is a, a little bit more, more useful, or a little bit more uh, common. Uh, Fibonacci, just you know, to, to go full steam ahead with the trivial examples, um, here it's an iterable because it implements uh, dunder item, uh, or dunder, dunder iter, sorry, uh, and it's also an iterator because it implements dunder next. Uh, so iter tools, um, there's lots of cool things in iter tools um, and you should have a look at them yourself. Um, just have a look in the docs, they're, they're, they're reasonably good. Um, one of them is itertools.count, uh, which just generates a forever sequence starting at zero uh, or the, the value that we pass in. So it's a little bit like range, but instead of a stop value, we just have a start value and it will go on forever. Um, we can also pass in a stop value and a step value as well. Um, but this, is, this basically goes on forever. Uh, a couple of the other ones in there, uh, I slice, uh, which we can pass a value and it will slice a, an iterator down to that length. Uh, and it's kind of like this, the, the slice operator uh, in, with lists or tuples. Uh, count, which we just saw there. And then cycle, which is reasonably interesting. So cycle will uh, repeat the values uh, or in the iterator passed to it. So here we can see A, B, C is passed into cycle uh, and we get the values A, B, C and then A again at the end and it will continue A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C um, for eternity as far as I can tell. And in Python 3, some of the built-ins like zip uh, take and return iterators rather than uh, previously where zip re returned a list. Uh, list comprehensions. Uh, I decided to choose a really big font size uh, for these title slides, and comprehensions didn't fit on the slide, uh, which is why I've hyphenated it like this. Um, I think it looks okay, though. Um, so list comprehensions uh, are an, a nice way to create lists from an existing iterator uh, or iterable. Uh, and they're also what made me fall in love with Python. Uh, I mean, I'd seen a lot of this stuff before, but uh, when I saw list comprehensions, I thought, this is, this is for me. Um, so here we're generating a new list. Uh, so imagine we have uh, some people that we pulled out of a database uh, with a Django ORM or something similar like that. Um, and we just want to get the people's names. So we're going to call p.name for every p in people. And we get the names Ro, John, Lucy, and Tom. Um, we can also add an if clause to uh, a list comprehension. So here we're going to get the names of people who are not bosses. Uh, so in my house, this is me and my son, Tom. Um, and finally, uh, uh, with list comprehensions, we can have multiple for loops, which are sort of um, multiple ifs, which are, are they're nested. Um, so here we can see on the top line there, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's one plus one, one plus two, one plus three, uh, and so on. And the second line is two plus one, two plus two, two plus three. Uh, and, and so these are um, all the permutations of two dice rules. Uh, so generator expressions. Uh, generator expressions look uh, very similar to list comprehensions, but create generators. Um, and generators are also iterators and iterable. Um, this is where it gets a little bit confusing. Um, so if we change the square brackets to round brackets, we get a generator object. Uh, and we don't actually get the, name, the values out until we iterate over the, the generator. Uh, so we can pass the, the uh, generator to list. Uh, so in this case, uh, we can actually remove the, the round brackets from the generator because we're just going to put them straight into list. Uh, and we can see we get the, the values out. So this is the same as our list comprehension. 
Um, they're also useful in for loops if you don't need the intermediate list. So rather than going through all of the, um, rather than putting everything in a list and then iterating over the list, we can just use a, a generator expression like this. In, uh, in likelihood, though, you would probably just uh, have a for loop over people and then do something with p name uh, in the loop. So generators are very similar to iterators, and they're the generate expressions generate generators or create generators. Um, so generators, um, they use the yield keyword, um, and they give us for free a dunder iter and a dunder next, um, as well as a nice side effect of returning to the yield or resuming at the yield the next time we, we call next. So here's another Fibonacci uh, example. Um, so the first time we call next uh, on, the on a new Fibonacci, we'll come down to the A um, and we will get a value back. And then we can call next again and we'll get another A and another A and another A. Um, so if we remember our previous Fibonacci uh, example, uh, which is all of this carry on, um, the generator is, is quite, a, quite a bit nicer to write. And it works the same way. So we create a Fibonacci and we keep calling next and we get our values, uh, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, uh, 21, I think. Uh, we have to be careful with these as well as infinite um, iterators. Uh, if we pass them to list, we can end up in an infinite loop, um, which is where we would use iter tools to I slice. Yield from uh, is the other use of the yield keyword in Python, or the second of the, th the three I'll mention, and possibly uh, only three. Um, so yield from allows us to delegate to uh, a sub-iterator. So in, in this change in Python, or this was, yield from was added in Python 3.3, um, but before 3.3, this was a reasonably common pattern to see, which is, um, you know, 4x and x is yield x. And this is fine, um, but in Python 3.3, uh, we can do this yield from, which is maybe slightly nicer. Um, that's all there is to yield from, really. So we've seen a bunch of ways to iterate, uh, create iterables, iterators, generators. Uh, and coroutines are somewhat related, um, but they're a little bit off on a tangent. And they're, they also use the, key, the yield keyword, which is why I've kind of uh, included them here as well. Uh, and they're useful for creating pipelines of operations. And the way that we do it is that we move the yield to the right, uh, that's my right and that's your right, uh, the right hand of the assignment. Um, and this allows us to send values into the coroutine. So previously we were yielding values out of a generator. Now we're uh, sending values into a generator. Uh, so we can see yield here on the right hand side of the item equals um, assignment. Um, and we're going to be able to send values in here. Um, so the advantage of being last thing on a Friday is that I can add these uh, things I've learned this week, like F strings, uh, to my slides at 2 in the morning. Uh, well, 2 this morning, actually. Uh, so I decided to add them here. So the way we use this, uh, we call next um, to, to do what's called priming the coroutine. Um, so this just advances us to the first yield, uh, and then control is returned back to where we are, and then we can start sending values in. So we're going to send in row Lucy Tom, and our printer is going to add the value 0, 1, 2 to the, to the front of our, our strings. So here we, we send row, and we get 0 row, and uh, on we go. Uh, and this is, a kinda, this is the best I could think of for how to, how to sort of visually represent a coroutine. Uh, and we'll, we're going to call this kind of coroutine a sync. Um, and we mentioned pipelines, and we'll see how this sort of works uh, shortly. So a slightly different version here where we can pass in a predicate function. So this will print any item um, where the predicate on that, that thing is true. Um, so the easiest way to, to understand what's going on here is uh, we're going to create um, a predicate where we're going to check if the second letter is U. Uh, uh, and it's only this because, because of my examples. Um, so we can see that Roe doesn't pass, so she, uh, her name isn't printed. Lucy does pass, so her name is printed. And then again, Tom 
uh, doesn't pass, so he's not printed either. Uh, the problem with this, though, is that we've sort of tied up our filtering logic and our printing logic. Um, so once again, filter printer is also a sync. Uh, and these are, not, these, are, these are useful, but not super useful. Um, so we skip over this, because um, this is a little bit wild, but basically what we're doing, um, oh no, sorry, we're not going to skip over this. Uh, so here we're going to pass the sync into this coroutine. Uh, and then every time we send a value into this coroutine, uh, we're going to send it onto the sync. So you can see this is sort of becoming uh, more of a pipe and less of a, less of a sync. Uh, and I've added this coroutine uh, decor at the top here. Uh, here is defined. But basically what we're doing is uh, we're just sort of automatically priming it with that call to next, and then we return the primed coroutine. And there are reasons that you don't necessarily want to do this uh, if you've got a lot of setup at the start of your coroutine. Um, but for the rest of the slides, uh, this is a kind of useful thing to have, and it removes some of the boilerplate that we'll see shortly. Um, there is also a coroutine decorator in uh, the async I.O. module, um, but that's different to this, and it does different things. So our filter uh, that we've just seen is now a pipe rather than a sink. Um, so I've, there are now two arrows, one on either side. And how we use it is uh, we can create a printer sink at the top there. Uh, we have this filter pipe, uh, which our predicate is uh, to print people who can drive. And we pass our printer into taxi drivers there. And then for P and people, we're going to send all the people to our taxi driver's filter pipe, which will then send them onto our printer pipe. Uh, so we can see here the two people that can drive are Roe and John. So my wife and I can drive. Um, so this is slightly more useful. Um, we can maybe start to see how this might become useful. Um, and it looks like this. So we now have a, a, small, a small pipeline. So we can send values in on the left-hand side there, and they come through the filter, and then maybe come through the, pipe, uh, through the printer at the end. And we could start to build up some quite interesting um, pipelines. Um, so the, the Unix um, utility T is, uh, is the namesake of this uh, coroutine. So we're going to pass in a list of sinks, and uh, we're just going to fan out. Sorry, we're going to fan out our uh, anything that's sent to T to all of our uh, sink um, coroutines that get passed in. So the way that this might work is we could create a log, which is our printer. We're going to have um, a boss filter and a driver filter, uh, which both send to log. And then we're going to create our, a T coroutine, which takes both boss and drive. And we'll send our people in again. And we can see here that Ro prints twice because she's both a boss and a driver. So she comes through both uh, filters. Uh, John comes through the, the driver filter. And Lucy comes through the boss filter. Why you would ever use this, I'm not entirely sure, but it's, it's sort of fun to, to think about and to, to, to write. And here's a visual representation of this. So values coming in on the left, getting sent to both boss and driver, and then potentially coming back down to the printer at the end. Um, so now for something uh, a bit different, uh, which you shouldn't do. So our, our coroutine pipelines, um, even when they're fairly simple, tend to look a bit like this. Um, and the thing at the end is always deeply nested. And we know from, from PEP20 that, that uh, flat is better than nested. Um, other languages, including uh, Bash and Elixir and, and Clojure, have uh, nice constructs um, for dealing with this sort of thing, where we can pipe things together. Uh, so here's a whole bunch of magic. Um, we're going to wrap our coroutines in a partial. Then we're going to wrap the, the partial in this powerful combinator object, um, which overloads the POW operator. And this could certainly be tidied up a bit. There's a lot of kind of weird stuff. That, this is not easy to follow, and this is also not getting a thumbs up on, on uh, code review. Um, but it allows us to do this. Um, and as weird as this looks, this does work. Um, so an example here, we, the, we have this range, which is uh, not the actual range. Uh, it's, it's one I had to define myself, which will generate the values 10 to 15. So uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We're going to filter out only the even values to get 10, 12, and 14. 
and then we're going to send those onto the printer. And it works, um, but yeah, don't do this. Um, So that's pretty much um, all I have. So we've had a look at loops, recursion, um, iter tools, comprehensions, generators, coroutines, and then that stuff at the end that you shouldn't do. Um, but thanks very much for coming uh, and for listening. Um, again, that's my Twitter name, uh, and the slides should be on Twitter very soon. I just want to thank you, and are there any questions? Thank you very much, John. Questions? Thanks for the talk. Um, I noticed you had a nested list comprehension in there, but there wasn't a yellow sticky note on it saying you shouldn't do that um, yeah. or it wouldn't pass code review. Um, is that something that you think should pass code review or um, is it something that should be kind of split out into maybe a loop and a list comprehension? OK, uh, so the question is, uh, I guess, how complicated should list comprehensions be? Uh, and my kind of rule for, for thumb is if you're doing more than two things, don't do it. Unwrap it into a for loop. So if you are you know, creating a tuple on the left-hand side from keys and values, maybe, um, or you, are, um, you have a, a for with an if, uh, which is preferred to the sort of functional filter now, um, or you're doing anything slightly more complicated, or if you have to write it over two lines, I would suggest unwrapping it into a for loop and then just appending to a list or something like that. Uh, I, I've got one further question, if that's okay. Um, so it, it, the method you've shown of kind of composing these pipes with sinks and things like that seems quite a powerful way of transforming data mm -hmm. um, with, with these reusable components. And, but you don't tend to see this style of programming very often. Uh, and I wondered why you think that might be, or even maybe this isn't Pythonic in some way. That's quite possible. Um, so the question is, why do we not see coroutines and pipelines more often? I think it's, I think it's just weird. I don't think it's, yeah, it's, you can do it a lot more easily, a lot more, um, it's a lot easier to understand in other ways. Uh, I think the first talk I saw on coroutines, someone asked, uh, the first question was, what was the original problem you were trying to solve um, by writing this code? And there, isn't, there wasn't really an answer. So don't do it, I guess. Any other questions? Sure. Hi. Um, could you bring up the slide with the Dunder Power again and maybe talk a bit why about you recommended not to use that? So why, why not use this? Yeah, what was bad about that? Um, I, there's, there's too much going on. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily suggest you write this style of code anyway, um, but there's, there are partials, uh, there are nested functions, there are star args, star star quarks, there are, there's overloading built-in methods just to do a little trick, uh, which is the, the star star, uh, to create the pipeline. Um, yeah, you, you can do this stuff. It doesn't mean you should do this stuff. OK, so the same would be for Dunder Mole or matrix multiplication. It's just the whole idea of chaining them is a bit complex, is it? Yeah, yeah I think so. Any more questions? I have a question myself. Uh, I find myself something, uh, sometimes wondering if I should use a lambda, a partial, or a local definition of a function. Do you have a preference for that? Um, it, it depends. Um, I've seen u good uses of all, all three. Um, I, don't, I don't know that there's a good answer. To that, I think it depends what looks good, um, what the rest of the style in the code base looks like. Um, if lambdas are generally avoided, generally avoid them. Um, I think partial is, is reasonably unknown. 
um, because it lives in funk tools, uh, which is reasonably unknown. Uh, so I would probably avoid that. A lot of people would probably need to look up the docs on that. Um, so yeah, again, it depends. Okay, thanks. Okay, that's it then, I think. Uh, so please give him a big applause.